problem. I'm going to kick off so we don't run over time. People can join um, join late. So this afternoon session, and and I just want to 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 explain to to the group that we we've got here. I was just talking to Andrew about it. So so what Sapex have done is that if, if you've attended the events, there are a series of webinars, there's a community connect session, and in between we have different workshops and things happening. So um, we're ramping up our young professional um, students initiative because we want to make sure that we are, we are educating our future supply chain professionals um, and they have the knowledge that they need to when they leap into the world, working world. So we have now added um, a series of young professional webinars, and we've we've also added a, a Youth Connect session to our calendar. So they'll happen bi-weekly, alternatively. So the session this afternoon is, is intended as a young professional webinar, but obviously it's open to anybody else that wants to attend. Okay, so I just want to just want to share that with you. This is our, the, our first young professional webinar, but obviously it's open to anybody else that wants to attend it. Um, and the session this afternoon is on learn how to optimize your supply chain with the supply chain operations reference model score. Um, in essence, a horizontal abstract process, architecture and methodology for companies that want to develop supply chain applications. SCORE is a process reference, which is a cross industry standard diagnostic tool for supply chain management. The SCORE model describes the business activities associated with satisfying a customer's demand, which includes plan, plan, source, make, deliver, return and enable. Use of the model includes analyzing the current state of a company's processes and goals, quantifying operational performance and comparing company performance to competitive data. So in this session, you're gonna learn what SCORE is about, how can I use it to, to make an impact in my current role and how top performing companies have used SCORE to realize performance improvement. So you are in the capable hands of Andrew DeSantos and I'm gonna let Andrew do his own introduction to you so that you can, um, you, he can do his own introduction and you can get a little bit more of a, a personal message from him. So, Andrew, would you please take it away for us? Sure thing. Hi, guys. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Andrew DeSantos. Um, I'll do a bit more of an introduction as to what I do, but uh, my... My, my first passion is supply chain management and everything around it. Um, and so the school model is the perfect uh, combination of all those things uh, with regard to that. And today I'm going to be doing a introduction for you to the school model. Some of you probably know a little bit about it. Um, but this, this session is usually done over a three hour period. So I'm going to have to speed, I'm going to have to go a little bit faster than I would like. But this is, the SCORE model is a big idea. It's a big thing. Um, and so to really get a grasp of it, I need to show you at least a little bit of every piece of it. Um, so if I go a little bit too fast, um, I would like to uh, just, just stop me and uh, ask questions as you like. Okay. So as uh, I'm, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen because uh, Zoom says, says you can. Um, but who am I? Um, I am a director of a company called CLX and I head up a division of that of that company called CLX Flow. We're a supply chain management coaching company. We do best practice assessments, systems implementation and pro project management and we also do some development. And I see uh, Martin's on the call here as well. He works with me in the data science competency within that division. Um, we specialize in taking a look at companies' entire business, uh, or, sorry, operating model um, from the point of view of a supply chain of the supply chain, um, and we do work across industry, uh, working with places like Multitech. I see Ferrets in the in the in the call, all the way through to guys like Impact Plastics, and uh, 
more recently, we've been doing a lot in the public healthcare space, uh, designing an entire operating model using most of SCORE. And uh, just, to, just to put that out there, that SCORE is not the only model out there. It's often a combination of models that works the best, in my experience. But SCORE is really the best basis for, for, for this kind of work. Um, we, step, we created an operating model in Mozambique uh, for the central medical stores. Um, uh, which is going to be uh, implemented hopefully beginning of next year. And of course, uh, if you've been following uh, SAPEX, there's a lot of work around the people that deliver um, uh, competence and, and uh, organization. And we're working very closely with them to define a professionalization uh, method for public healthcare supply chain, all based in SCORE itself. Okay, so SCORE is being, we use SCORE in practically everything we do. And then to link up with that, we have two other divisions. One of them is CLX Evolve, which is our digital learning competence. So everything, everything new and shiny in the world of, of uh, learn tech is done there. And then CLX Learn, where we do all the usual stuff, the Apex and Sapex courseware, as well as CTO credited logistics and supply chain management. These guys also resell for us the score P, which is the course that is attached to uh, the score model. It's the way that you become endorsed um, <clears throat> to implement score within an organization. Um, <clears throat> so before I begin, uh, I'd like to get one question out the door um, from the audience and, and maybe I'll take a little bit from each from a couple of people. But <clears throat> if you were in the position where you needed to redesign the supply chain of an organization, what would be the high level steps you would take? Anyone from the audience? <clears throat> Nobody wants to offer up a, um, no a comment. Mm -mm. Nothing. Okay. So I'll tell you what the, what the answer probably would have been, um, is that they would usually go into analysis paralysis. They would start by taking a look at what the business is doing. You'd probably have a whole lot of, uh, of uh, qualitative opinions on, <clears throat> on how the business is doing and, and what it's doing wrong. And you'd start there. And then as you go through, you'll, you'll uncover more and more and more of of a spider web of processes that run through your business. A spider web of technologies, processes, some competencies here and there would be identified. And it could take upwards of two to three years <clears throat> to fully map out your entire business process. And when you juxtaposition that against what you can do with the score model, if for an entire country's public healthcare system, we did it in four days. Okay, and not only did we map out processes, we mapped out processes, we mapped out human resource requirements, technology requirements, and most of all, the strategy, the supply chain strategy that the organization wanted to follow. So this is something that I want to share with the world because I believe it is something that is incredibly powerful for supply chains. And, and uh, if, you, if you know me at all, you know that I'm all about uh, pushing the boundaries of African supply chains, trying to get more supply chain management and, and, and manufacturing being done in Africa. And so anything I can do to help that along is, is, is something I'm very passionate about. So today what, what I want to show to you guys is a way I want to explore the origins and goals of the SCORE model. I want to show you and, and make sure that you get an understanding of the structure of the SCORE model. I want to show you all the different pieces of the SCORE model. So that includes performance, processes, practices, people, and then just a general, um, just a general look at the, how to develop a SCORE improvement program. So that when you come out of this session, you have an idea <clears throat> as they at least start how to start engaging um, with either your organization or with the content of the score model to actually do something with it in your organization. You may not be able to have everything you need after this uh, session, but at least you'd have an idea of where to start. So to start off, and please stop me if I'm going too quickly at any moment, um, I would like to answer the question of what is score? SCORE is an acronym for the Supply Chain Operations Reference Model. And it was developed by practitioners, by supply chain practitioners in companies, and it's on its 12th 
uh, its 12th version. And it's constantly being, uh, being added to and changed. I mean, it was instrumental in the, in the, I think in the mergers and acquisitions uh, during the 1990s of the different computer uh, companies. Um, and it was used to develop and assist businesses in understanding, structuring, and evaluating the performance of supply chains. So people often look at us at the score model and they think it's just a process reference. And it has a process reference in it for sure. But the real power of score, and, and you can go and check this, there's tables on the internet about comparing score with all the other models out there, things like APQC, PCF, uh, you've got a, a global supply chain model that's out there, and people are coming up with their own models all the time. But what SCORE really does well is it links the processes, human resources, even technology and, and, and tools to a strategic imperative. So it really answers the question of how do I translate my business plan or my business strategy into a supply chain strategy or an operation strategy? So how do I make everybody push in the same direction? I mean, if you work in some of these organizations, for example, that they have these massive machines that can churn out thousands of pieces in, in an hour, and then you go and ask them, what is your strategic imperative? And they'll immediately tell you, no, to be responsive to the customer. Okay, so I want to be as fast as possible with my with, with my supply chain. And then you ask them, okay, but uh, will you be fast, but sacrifice your capacity on that massive machine that you need to get you need to get recoveries against? And they sort of look at you and think, mm, maybe not. Okay, so what is the real answer there? Do you want to be fast or do you want to get utilization? Okay, and that really starts to frame the conversation around around your supply chain strategy and around how you actually interact as a supply chain. And this is something that's becoming and has been becoming more important for the last 10 years, as long as, as, long as I've known about supply chain management, um, is that it, is, it has becoming and has become, in fact, a strategic competitive advantage for an organization. It's no longer just, oh, we just need to get material from there to there and it's, uh, inventory management and all that. It is a strategic, it's, it's, a, it's a point that can be leveraged strategically for a business. It can differentiate you from your, from your competitors uh, depending on how you operate your supply chain. And that's, that's something to, to think about in terms of being part of SAPEX and, and, and watching the different things that are happening out there, because really the, the supply chain methodologies and thought leadership is going to mean a massive difference for businesses um, as we come out of COVID and the future. So what is, what is SCORE define? So the SCORE model, and, and I always use the APEX dictionary. If, if you have anything to do with SAPEX, you probably do too. Um, <clears throat> the SCORE model describes the business activities associated with satisfying a customer's demand, which include, as Tonya said, plan, source, make, deliver, return, and enable. And it's interesting that when, whenever you come into a supply chain problem, you can usually define it by these six, six pieces. The only piece that I would probably say is a little bit light on the score model is the finance piece. But usually what I do is I tack on PCF with the finance piece for the specific industry and it works just fine. Um, the use of the model includes analyzing the current state and this is not going into the implementation approach. Uh, use of the model includes analyzing the current state of a company's processes and goals, quantifying operational performance, key point and comparing company performance to benchmark data. Now, at that point is a little bit of a sticky one um, in terms of being in Africa and South Africa. While I agree that we should always be pushing towards international standards, and I think that is, that is the case um, for, for the most part, to sell that in, into an organization is sometimes difficult. The SCORE has developed a set of metrics and best practices inf and inf uh, practice information that a company can use to evaluate their supply chain performance. And that is a key. Those supply chain performance attributes <clears throat> are the link between your business strategy and your supply chain strategy. So a little bit about the process framework and what it, what it entails. And this, this starts going a little bit into the, the implementation approach. And <clears throat> the way you really start off with is from a business process improvement. And you want to capture the as is business activity and design the future to be state. Now this is where we start crossing into the realms of your analysis paralysis sort of situation where people want to get out these big brown paper, brown paper pages and spend years analyzing. 
And what SCORE allows you to do is it allows you, because you've got building blocks that you can work on, you can literally take, you can literally see the business through the eyes of the process, the SCORE processes which allows you, as I said, to capture the as is of multiple supply chains in a really, really short amount of time. The shortest time that we've managed to do it in is six hours. And we, this was to design a brand new business from scratch. <clears throat> and then obviously, if you've got an as is, you can then take the to be in as little time. Okay. Obviously, depending on, on the reason for this business process improvement, it can take longer, especially if you need to, for example, get, uh, <clears throat> get buy-in from the organization, get the right people together. All those corporate uh, things can, can slow you down quite a bit. But that's where you largely will use your business process uh, piece for it. Then the next step is because we've got standardized processes, we can really bring in some performance benchmarking. So that's one of the reasons, one of the big reasons for SCORE's existence is to standardize the process blocks in an organization such that if you were to compare yourself, for example, if I was telecom, I'd be able to compare a telecommunications company like telecom with, let's say, the Botswana, Botswana uh, telecommunications network. And because if both of them are using the score model, you have an exact like for like that you're comparing. You're not comparing one process, one piece of the process with a completely different process. Some people uh, talk about it as <clears throat> a supply chain is, is like an elephant and the score model allows you to say, okay, I am looking at the trunk of the elephant and then I compare, compare two companies' trunks together. Okay, then the next piece, because we have the business processes defined, we can also bring in some best practice analysis. So in the SCORE model against every single uh, block in the SCORE model, we have best practices attached to it. So it allows us to really quickly identify practices and software solutions that result in significantly better performance. And I'll talk, hopefully I'll get there in time to talk in depth about this, but um, the SCORE model is constantly adding new best practices uh, into the mix. Recently, I saw that uh, demand-driven MRP was added as a best practice. Now, that's significant because the SCORE model splits things into uh, leading practices and best practices and then lagging practices. So, obviously, DDMRP is becoming more, uh, uh, more standard across the industry and is moving now into the best practice space, which is quite exciting for me as... DDMRP is one of my one of my favorite topics at this point in time. And then finally, and probably one of the pieces that is is most powerful is in organizational design. So this now takes the processes, practices, performance, brings it all together, and then <clears throat> allows you to see the skills and performance that's need to make your vision a reality. And this is the part that we leveraged quite a lot with the PTD project in coming up with the professionalization methods for uh, public health care. And I'm hoping that <clears throat> there's very few times in, in your life you get to, you get to uh, contribute so significantly in such a, such a, a, a I suppose, altruistic way. Um, and I'm hoping that'll change millions of people's lives. Now the score, the score framework is only one framework in the, in the basket of the Apex frameworks. And it's only one small piece at the bottom there. It's probably the most well-defined piece of, of the Apex framework, but it's certainly not the only piece. <clears throat> when we're looking at organizational design, there are three other frameworks that are, that are used prolifically. And I borrow from these all the time, depending on what my use case is. So if I'm working with a specifically like an engineering company, <clears throat> I would lead, lean extremely heavily into the design chain, which is your product and process, the process design, as well as my product and portfolio management, my product lifecycle management uh, uh, piece. And then of course, you need to, whatever business you're in, you need to consider your sales and support piece, which is where the, the customer chain uh, reference uh, manual also fits in. <clears throat> These ones, the top three are far less defined than the score model. The D core, for example, is probably your second best, and it only really has some some practices with not that many. I mean, not practices, processes with not that many practices in. 
uh, product portfolio management is sort of a one pager and same with cust customer change. These are always changing though, and I understand that Apex is going to be putting in quite a bit of effort in building those out further. <coughs> If you're interested in getting hold of more information on the SCORE model, there's some really good references out there um, that are immediately available to you. One of which is the SCORE app that you can get on, on iTunes and App Store, I mean, App Store and Google Play. And then obviously, if you were to do the, the SCORE P, you get access to the entire SCORE model, which is a book uh, that's two books, which are really, really good doorstops. They're, they're quite large. Um, uh, with all of this information in. Okay, so I think I've already spoken to a certain amount of the advantages of using the SCORE framework, <clears throat> but this really summarizes it quite nicely. Um, the scope of the SCORE framework really applies to the entire supply chain. And when I say the entire supply chain, I mean from customers, customers, customer to supplier, supplier, supplier. Okay, and the what you'll find it's interesting is that you'll have a you'll have the full score framework in each one of those organizations it really assists you in orientating the supply chain improvements around a standard set of performances practices processes and skills metrics <clears throat> it obviously enables the uh, supply chain performance and practice benchmarking but what i would note on that is if you didn't go for the benchmarking it still allows you if you can define your supply chain performance effectively it still allows you to use the performance that you're trying to achieve as a goal that everybody can get around okay it centers supply chain improvement efforts on creating value for customers so the question that always gets asked during supply chain performance discussions is not okay what performance do you want to perform at okay but why are we trying to perform in that way in that in that way it's because we need to provide something for the customer what does the customer see value in and then we align our performance to that it applies detailed supply chain metrics to measure supply chain performance what's great about it is you'll see in a moment that we have we have metrics that really are pyramid shaped so that we get this top level metric that's important to your CEO and business unit managers, and it rolls all the way down to, to on the ground measures of specifics. <clears throat> and then it establishes a common repository of supply chain performance terms and tool sets. I can't emphasize how important that last point is in that in organizations where we've implemented SCORE, we at CLX Flow, we're quite, we're quite proud of the fact that we, 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 hire, we, we never lose customers really. And we have customers that we've had for about 15 years plus. And these, when we've implemented SCORE in those organizations, when we come to discuss new improvements to their supply chain, they bring out the book that we defined with SCORE 15 years ago, and it's still used to frame their thinking even today. <coughs> So onto the score framework itself, and please stop me if you want if you have any questions. Onto the score, score framework itself, <clears throat> and the score framework really consists of five sections. It consists of performance, and this is probably the most important piece in my in my opinion. The performance of the score reference framework. As I said, there's many frameworks out there. Score is the only one that connects strategically to your business strategy. It of course has processes that can be used as building blocks to know which piece of the supply chain you're looking at. It has practices that suggest how you should be operating those practices, those processes. And of course there's multiple different practices. It, it is non-prescriptive as to what particular practice needs to be used. It has a section on people which defines the training, the aptitude, et cetera, that is needed in order to, to run your supply chain. And then it also has some sections on the special applications. So it used to be called the sustainable score, which includes some standard definitions of sustainable business models and environmental accounting. They've now built it out into, I think the last one is called score E or ASM E. They changed the name every now and again. And they've actually built out a whole, um, a whole framework for, for sustainable supply chain. Um, modeling everything from customer's customer as to how they extract the raw materials out of the ground all the way to how the customer utilizes and brings it back through a reverse or circular supply chain model. Um, but that's, we, we won't cover too much on that today as we can, we can talk an entire day about just that. 
So the first thing that to know about SCORE is that each of the SCORE model sections has its own codification and nomenclature. Okay? And in order to, to actually operate the SCORE model, you need to understand that codification and, and nomenclature. Um, the score performance and processes have hierarchies of score activities going usually from a level one all the way down to a level three. The score practices are then determined by three separate practices as I, as I mentioned to you before, emerging, best and standard. So obviously your newer practices that haven't quite, um, <clears throat> that haven't quite proven themselves will be an emergency. Best practices are what is the best right now. And then standard practices are usually some stuff that might be lagging a little bit or is just usually there as, as a starting point. Then score people is determined by a single level list of skills and process, processing activities. So it's just specifically what training and, and aptitudes are required uh, for, those, for, those operate, for those practices. Then, the, then you've got your sustainable score, which is just a, at that point in time was just a single list of, of skills and processing activities. As I said, that's been built out significantly since. And then most score activities are cross-referenced across the four major score sections. So you'll, you'll never get to a score table where it only references one piece of it. And I've got an example of that right here. So for example, what we have here is a, what we call a score table, which is effectively a, a page out of the score, the score manual. And as you can see, it's got its ID, which means this one in particular is that it's a score process, starts with S. It has a big M, which means it's a make process. And it's 2.6, which is just a, a serial number that says that this is a, um, I think this is a make to order a supply chain uh, make process. And then you've got your title, description, metrics, practices that will allow you to, to uh, uh, execute this process, the skills required. And then how, most importantly, how does, it in, how does it fit into the rest of the score processes? So you can see you've got an M2.5 coming in there. And this is the M2.6 and it outputs to all of those different pieces. Okay, so this is quite, quite in-depth stuff. Okay. And this is just an example of how one might put the different pieces together. I don't have enough time to go through this in detail, but I'm more than happy to discuss it afterwards if, if you would be interested. Okay. Now, my favorite piece, the score performance section. And the score performance section helps companies translate their business strategy, as I said, into a supply chain strategy. So often what happens is your, score, your business strategy starts out and it's great and it works. Then the business strategy changes over time, but the supply chain strategy never does. Okay, or hardly ever does. And then you get to a point where all of a sudden the supply chain is actually hampering the output of the business strategy. So we need to always answer the question of how closely is the supply chain strategy meeting the business plan objectives. Okay. And the business and performance, the performance section of score really helps with that. It assists you in measuring the supply chain performance. So how good are we doing? How are we trending? Like, and if you had access to the total uh, benchmarking uh, suite that Apex provides, you'd be able to see how you're trending in comparison to other, to other uh, organizations that also have implemented SCORE. It also allows you to understand the relative performance compared to your competitors, as I said, with the benchmarking. And even more importantly, in my opinion, it allows you to understand the relative importance of different performance metrics. So what is my primary interest? Am I cost sensitive? Am I responsive? Am I reliable? Which one is most important? And it really gives your, your supply chain um, your supply chain workforce a direction to pull together, a uh, direction in which they can all pull together. And then of course, with any, any uh, performance, it allows you, to, it helps you to identify and monitor your processes such that you can continuously improve. And really importantly, because it tells you what to measure, it also tells you where to measure it in your, in your process. And so you're never, you're, whenever you improve against one of these metrics, you're not just improving for the sake of improvement to, to get a nice little tick on your Excel spreadsheet at the end of the quarter, you are actually improving and moving your business further into performing against your business strategy, which is incredibly powerful. It's one of the reasons why I, 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 I support the score model so prolifically. 
So to get into some detail about the performance, uh, the performance piece of score, <clears throat> we have what we call at the top called a performance attribute, which is a characteristic used to describe a strategy. And these performance attributes serve as classifications for the metrics that we'll discuss next. And these performance attributes really describe, they describe that supply chain strategy um, uh, that you, wanna, you want everyone to pull towards. Then one, one level down, you then have your metric, which is a standard measurement, a me measurement for the performance of a supply chain or process. And <clears throat> these measurements, they really measure the ability of the process to actually achieve that strategic objectives. And what you'll see is that score actually recognizes three levels of predefined metrics, all of those rolling up into a set uh, number of performance, performance attributes. <clears throat> Then uh, another section to always uh, take into account is your process and practice maturity, which is of course the measurement of process and practice effectiveness, which follows widely, widely used models for, the, for practice maturity, which compares different actual practices to descriptive representations of their levels and practice adoption and implementations. So these score performance metrics really are, they equal your diagnostic metrics. So a diagnostic metric means that it is used to monitor and diagnose your overall supply chain health. These are the metrics that you want to sit on a dashboard in front of your CEO or business unit manager so that he can take, take steps to, to analyze the, the gaps within your processes. So these are the primary or the, own, the performance metrics um, that we have within SCORE. And we can split them up into customer centric and internally focused. So we say customer centric because these are the questions that need to be asked about how we want to serve the, the customer. And then internally focused means what are these attributes that will allow us to compete uh, within this performance uh, performance uh, vertical. So the first one is reliability. And <clears throat> this one is always an interesting one because invariably, the first time you ask a, an organization which, which uh, performance attribute they, they uh, identify with, the first one will always be reliability and then the second one will always be cost, okay? What I need to stress when we talk about performance attributes is just because one of these attributes will be your primary attribute doesn't mean the other ones, that doesn't mean that you're not going to do anything about the other ones. Okay, just because reliability is, is the one you're going after doesn't mean that you're going to throw cost out the window. Okay, it just means that reliabilities are going to be our pr primary focus. So what reliability it means in this context, and we need to get the words exactly right because it's very difficult to separate some of these performance attributes out from each other because they are so interrelated. So reliability is, is consistently getting the orders right, that the product meets the quality requirements. And in the next slide, I'll show you some specific uh, metrics that are used, but this is usually measured by perfect order fulfillment. So right place, right time, your OTIF, all that stuff, okay? The piece that's often missing, of course, is that <clears throat> all of my documents internally and externally are completed co correctly. So for example, when you walk into a, a, a company often, you have a, the sales orders, for example, are often not cleaned out and that is gonna hamper your reliability in the future. <clears throat> Sorry. Then the next, pro, the next attribute is responsiveness, which is, is effectively speed. This is one of the easier ones to understand. It's the consistent speed of providing products. The next one is agility, which is the ability to respond to changes in the market. An interesting point on that is that the, the organizations that were the most agile in this co during this COVID-19 thing were probably the ones that are coming out on top today. Then of course you've got cost, which is the total cost of managing and operating the supply chain. This does not include the cost of assets though. This is literally my order processing cost, my, uh, my uh, planning cost, that sort of thing. Then the final one is your asset management effectively, effectiveness. So this is gonna be my return on assets, my cash to cash cycle, that sort of thing. 
So this is just a diagram that displays the level one strategic metrics. And in general, what you'll do with these attributes is you'll choose one that is your top priority. So let's say reliability. You'll then choose two that are at your next level. We call it the first one is uh, superior, the next one is an advantage, and then the last two you need to be at the very least parity. If you say all of these things need to be at parity, and I have had it, it means you really don't have a strategic direction at all. Okay, so that's sort of how we how we how we analyze that situation. And this is how the different performance metrics relate to each other. So if we take a performance attribute like reliability, we then break it down into perfect order fulfillment, and then we can split it out further into your level two diagnostic metrics, which would then be something like uh, number of deliveries on time, number of deliveries to the right, to the right quality, um, number of de deliveries where the, the, the documentation was completely filled. And then we get that total percentage. And if any one of those attributes comes out negative, then your perfect order fulfillment percentage goes down. And this is effectively what you'll get in the score model itself to show you how a performance metric is defined. So we'll have our metric at the top, a definition and a calculation. You'd have a method of data collection as well as, as a discussion. So little things that you need to take into account when you measure this. And then what diagnostic level two metrics are attached. And obviously at diagnostic level two, you'd have diagnostic level three attached to that. Now, we running straight into the processes, as Tanya said, we've got a we've got plan, make, source, deliver, return, and enable. Okay, and, and you can see that they're all very much connected to each other. Um, we've got plan that covers everything or the entire the entire supply chain. We have enable that covers the entire supply chain. And then we have our source, which is typically your procurement side, your make, which is manufacturing deliver which is your sales process some of your sales process as well as your delivery your outbound delivery process and then you have your return which is your reverse supply chain the two pieces that are often miss uh, often just completely ignored is the, the the couple of places actually is the plan so people don't think about how they plan they usually go straight into the source make deliver and they forget to add the plan then they forget to add all the different pieces of the enable process as well as the return process. Now, I saw SAPEX has just released, I think it was today, they released a, a webinar, or they, the, there's going to be a webinar coming up on the circular supply chain, which would be really interesting from a return point of view. And I think that the circular supply chain is something that Africa is going to be really well poised to take advantage of as well. So the objectives of the score processes is to document a consensus view of the total, the total supply chain. It's also to document the capabilities of the organization. You can also use it to document the technologies that go with it, all the practices and the HR all in one. Um, Flow uses a, a massive spreadsheet that we bring to clients and we fill the, that spreadsheet out in front of the client with all of these aspects attached. And in fact, we've, we've digitized that whole process even further. Martin on the call is the one that actually built it. Um, to actually allow us to put all that data straight into a digital system and then display it uh, on dashboards uh, immediately after that process. And once you're done with the, with the analysis process, you'll have something that resembles, resembles this. So you can see your organization in the middle with a central plan that should allow you to see up and down the supply chain. And <clears throat> about 10 years ago was the first time I ever saw this. And back then, the concept of a supply chain control tower was 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 not created was not around yet. It was there, but bits and pieces. And once this this idea of the the control tower came to play, that's where I started seeing. Oh wow! Okay, Score saw this way before anybody else. And you can see that plan right at the top there could effectively be your your control tower that allows you to see across organization and the organizations. And there's some really exciting technologies that are coming into the fray, like your blockchain, like your IoT, et cetera, that are making that possible. 
But effectively what you'll have is you'll have your organization in the middle and you'd have your deliver processes and return processes interacting with your customer's source and return processes and your source and return processes interacting with your suppliers deliver and return processes such that, and you can see how you can string all these supply chain or score model uh, pieces across the organization, across the entire, entire supply chain from customer's customer to supplier supplier. And effectively, this is how the, the score processes are divvied up. So you have your major processes at the top, which define the scope, content, and performance targets of the supply chain. And those are divided into your plan, source, make, deliver, return, and enable processes. Then, and that's your level one. Okay. Then you go one level down into level two, <clears throat> which then defines the operations strategy. So what are the process capabilities that are required to, to service the supply chain? And that's where you define do I have a make to stock supply chain? Do I have a make to order supply chain? Engineer to order. And in the most recent releases, they introduced the retail supply chain as well. This is constantly evolving as well. <coughs> Apologies. Then when we go down one level into the level three process elements, we now go into the configurations of the individual processes and the ability to execute. So we now start asking the questions of, what do I need to do to process an inquiry and quote? What do I need to do to receive intent validate an order? And we can go through uh, step by step according to the process framework. Then the final level, the level four, is the nitty gritty of the specifics, the SOPs, uh, the practices, the specific process the practices that are used. And our score will define the practices in general that need to be used, but this is where your own intelligence and your own uh, application within an organization comes in, where we need to define the specifics of, I'm going to click there and then the data is going to go there and I'm going to click there and the data is going to go there. But obviously this knowing exactly what the, what the scope of each one of those processes is, allows you to stop a whole lot of that wheel spinning. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but these are examples of your level twos and level threes um, in your score, in your score uh, model. So the first thing that you usually do is you define at each location and at each piece of the organization, whether you do a deliver process, a plan process and a source process um, at each location. And you would then need to define whether it is a make to stock, make to order, engineer to order, or a retail process. And you can get combinations of the two. For example, if you've got an assemble to order, an assemble to order supply chain, you'd have a combination of make to stock up to a point and then make to order thereafter. Okay. I'm not, I unfortunately don't have time to go through any of these in detail, but I'm more than happy to discuss these thereafter if you guys have any questions. Okay. <clears throat> so then the, just to talk a little bit further on the different types of, of supply chains that we see, um, the first difference is the, or the major difference is the stocked process versus make to order versus engineer to order. So obviously a stocked process is a replenishment or inventory plan driven, driven, it's standardized materials, it's high fill rates and high inventory risks. So these are your typical um, MRP driven supply chains that push stock out to the edge. Usually you can do it with lean, of course, uh, and DDMRP, of course, is a new, a new practice that's being introduced. Then of course you have your make to order supply chain thereafter, which is custom order driven. It allows configurable materials, and it usually has longer lead times, lower inventory risk. And you can appreciate that there's gonna be some differences in the processes, whether you choose a stocked product or a make to order product. <coughs> then finally, on the engineer to order side, it's totally customer requirements driven. There are processes built in here for sourcing, um, for sourcing new materials, for creating contracts, for executing contracts. If you can imagine how you build a bridge, that's the supply chain that does that one. It has the longest lead times, very low fill rates and low inventory uh, risks, but it's an expensive process and supply chain, the, the score model tries to reduce that risk. Again, I'm, I can't really talk to the processes. There's not enough time. 
Then once we've defined the processes, um, <clears throat> we can now start bringing in the practices. And this is where things really start getting fun. Once you've got all the processes put in and everyone gets very excited during that period because all of a sudden you've got everybody from mid-management all the way to the top suddenly talking exactly the same language, we can now start attaching practices to that, which is that against every single one of the processes, we have specific practices that can be used. So for example, cycle counting would be one of those practices. DDMRP would be one of those practices. Barcoding could be one of those practices. And in SCORE, we have four definitions of practices. The first one is, of course, emerging practices that introduce new technologies. They're radically different ways of organizing your processes and, and executing your processes. <clears throat> usually with some risk because there's not as much evidence to support their, their existence. You then have best practices that are the current, very repeatable. There's a lot of basis for, for why people are doing it, why people are, are using those practices. You then have a standard practice that usually comes about by default. So <clears throat> for example, and in using an invoicing book is probably a bit of a declining practice now, but you'll see it everywhere anyway. And then declining practices that represent ways of doing businesses that were widespread at one point, but result in, in actually poor performances indicated by the metrics. So for example, a manual cardex system. Um, if we have anybody from government in here or the military, they still use manual cardex systems. If you ever go and, and uh, pick up something from a, from a warehouse in the military, for example, they'll bring out a massive book and then you've got, to, you've, you've got to write in that book and that book gets processed manually across the supply chain. Then when we're defining uh, score process uh, practices, sorry, um, we then have specific level one practices. So for example, if we want to achieve a business process analysis or improvement, we can use these processes. So automated data capturing, business rule management, business rule review, et cetera. And each one of those practices has its own codification, which you'll see across score. Everything is codified to a certain extent. Okay, and there'll be a description and, a, and specific places where each one can, can be used. And all of these get brought into your score practices repository, which is then linked to your level two and level three practice processes. And this is an example of how those processes actually look. Um, one method that is used quite, quite prolifically when you're looking for best practice selection is to use a grid somewhat like this, where you split out practices depending on their effort or risk or what, the high, what their level of return will be. And if you've ever done a business process improvement, you would have seen something very similar to this. Okay, then the final piece of this and, and probably a little bit less um, defined as the rest of it is the score people section. As I said, I, I lean on this quite heavily when I'm defining competency frameworks for an organization. But what this, uh, pro, this piece uh, describes is a skills management focus that connects all of the process pieces, all of the practice pieces, all of the performance pieces into one place that allows you to define what type of HR uh, profile you need in order to achieve what you're trying to do. And this section is really defined into three, into four uh, sections, which is your skill, your experience, the training required, and the competency required in order to, to fulfill the requirements of the process. And this can often be a little bit more uh, abstract but what we've tried to do in Flow is we've tried to build this into that same platform that I spoke to you about that Martin developed um, that actually allows you to assess these at the skill level, at the competency level to bring in the training and competencies required uh, to achieve your business goals. 
your competency levels, and this is, is very much uh, very much mirrors what we do in our competency frameworks, is that it really takes your competencies from a novice level all the way up to your expert level, which is of course your expert level is an intuitive understanding of the situation, whereas your novice is new to the field and often needs step-by-step -step detailed instructions. This is always a very, very useful uh, diagram. So when you get this uh, recording, uh, have a look at this one um, to define your competencies across your, your organization, um, including what type of instruction would be required at each different competency level, um, as well as what problem recognition you can actually expect. Nothing's more frustrating than giving somebody a job and you expect them to think in a very specific way and they don't. So this this diagram really helps a lot in defining your expectations from human resources as well. Then your skills are what, what specific things a person needs to be able to do in order to actually uh, fulfill the requirements of your business process. And this is what your people skills uh, table will look like. And you can see what's really great is that you've got a three-way matching uh, receiving receiving match. So this is a skill. This is something somebody needs to be able to do. And you can see that as soon as you look at the first piece where you see the processes, you can see all the different places where this particular skill, skill will be could be required. You can see what types of experience is required, what, what training, so where can I get this skill? And you can see very well Apex uh, has their CPIM on top. What a surprise. Um, <clears throat> to actually get this, this, this skill. And then of course, it links to the practice of three-way delivery verification. And you can see that you've got a cross linkage between these such that if you were to go and look at that best practice, you would then see a whole lot of other skills that would be required to achieve this. Okay, then the final piece of the SCORE model and probably one of the most, impo most important piece, pieces of this whole thing is the method of application. Okay, not only is this a framework, you got this massive library of skills, competencies, processes, et cetera, all in one place, but how do I actually get this implemented in an organization? And so what's really great is that there's a man by the name of Peter Bolstoff, who's now part of the a of Apex. He was previously part of the Supply Chain Council that actually generated or created the SCORE framework. And he came up with a method of excellence approach. There's a book on it. certainly helps with that process. Um, and he defined it, it defined a no fail method of actually getting score embedded into um, the organization. And what is really nice is that when he started with the Apex, uh, with Apex itself, he went and put a really nice um, diagram together, which we now call this the the score improvement program racetrack. Okay, previously it was this massive table that you had to try and try and get your head around. Now he's defined it into five significant steps, which starts with a pre-score program step, which is basically identifying the motiv motivation, getting people interested in score, finding the right stakeholders to actually bring to, to bring change within the organization, and then training people on how score, the score model hangs together. Sort of a longer version of what I'm showing you today is the SCORE P program, which is a three-day course on how to use SCORE and what SCORE is and how to use it. Um, sort of a bigger version of what we did now. Um, and this step is gated by permission, is, is gated at each step for a position to proceed to, to the next step. So if you can't get the stakeholder engagement, you can't get sign off uh, from the top layers of the organization. And it's really important that you do because SCORE is obviously an organization wide concept. Um, something to note there is a, IT, your, your CIO or your HR, uh, or even your supply chain uh, directors and organization are not great places to start with score. You really want the CEO um, involved in this, in this process. Um, if you can't get a sign, on, a sign off from those guys, 
don't move on to the next step. Of course, each piece of score can be used on its own. Uh, so you, if you just want to solve a small process problem, you can just take a look at it through the, through the eyes of score. But to really get the biggest bang for buck, you really want to go at least once around this racetrack. So if, after you've got that sign off, you move on to setting the scope. This is, this is in, that is out. This is what we're talking about to achieve. So it sets the scope so that you, you stop the wheel spinning when you get into the configuration piece so that you always know what you're talking about. Then the third step is configuring the supply chain where you actually start using the different pieces of the, of the process framework to actually start building out your supply chain uh, for, uh, for improvement. This is where you, you set your as is, you start uh, setting out your two Bs. And your final gate is that you, you need to have your level three process diagram complete with your as is and two Bs, as well as your gap analysis um, completed. So I have my as is, I have my two B, what is the gap between those two pieces? Then from that, you can start generating all the optimization process uh, projects. And, What's really great about the, the score model is that you can, you can create little projects that add up to something big. So you can take each piece, each piece of the gap that you discovered in, in step three, and you can create small projects that can be done in two to three weeks, four weeks, something like that, so that you can, you can, um, you can um, avoid project burnout quite nicely uh, when you define these optimization projects. And you can define them in little bite-sized chunks, which is great. You then, from that optimization pro optimized project step, you then have your a list, a almost exhaustive list. And I can't say it's not exhaustive because you you really can uh, find all the different pieces that you want to you want to tackle. You'll then come out with a prioritization so that you know exactly when to start, where to start, and then finally you come to ready for uh, implementation and you can actually start executing on those projects. Once you've gone round once on the racetrack, of course, because we're always trying to realign the supply chain strategy to the organization strategy, um, <clears throat> we are going to have to go around this racetrack over and over again as supply chains change, as environments change. And that is the score model in a, in a very fast nutshell. And I just, just made it in time. <laughs> Just as, as everybody has anybody got any questions? Because I think right now my head is spinning. <laughs> yeah. Um. Hi. Um. My name is Gia. I've got a question. Yes. My head yes. also um spinning quite a bit as well. Yep. Um. Okay. So as you we were going through the slides, I'm thinking to myself, what really is the difference between uh score and like your IMS? You know, your balance scorecard. Because I see there's a lot of aspects. Um, that are similar mm -hmm. between the two. And I mean, you know, we talk about the performance objectives. Um, you know, I see there's also quite a bit of those in score. How do they both relate to each other? Or is it just that score is just strictly a supply chain, uh, you know, um, reference model that is used strictly for that? And then in terms of the IMF, it's, it's more of an organizational. Because I mean, eventually, I mean, it starts from the top, a strategy and it mm -hmm. rolls down. And supply mm -hmm. chain, I mean, it's, it's an integral part of the business. So why is absolutely. it separate? Yeah, so if you get where I'm coming from. Sure, absolutely. So obviously, so you can actually use SCORE to assist you in generating that, that balanced scorecard. So making sure that you are obviously managing all the different pieces toward the performance requirements that you want, as well as the fact that immediately you have a connection all the way through down to uh, process people, technology and practices, so that you get a golden thread all the way through, where often a balanced scorecard, when it's defined, um, it usually gets defined once, and it's really great and all the rest of it, and slowly but surely things change. And to bring it back constantly, um, it can take a bit of time, a bit of, a bit of effort. And the score model really just allows you a quicker method of, of realigning yourself uh, continuously. All right. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions? It's a lot of information to digest, I know. 
Um, but I think like Andrew uh, mentioned at the beginning, there are, um, there are longer programs that dive into more detail um, that you can you take it, you know, digest it a little bit easier. This was just intended to give you a, a broader overview um, and it, it is a bit of a monster. Um, but we will make this session um, recording available. We'll send you a copy and we'll include Andrew's details so that if you've got any questions as a follow up, um, you are most welcome to contact Andrew and send him any questions. Absolutely. To engage with him further. Um, always happy to discuss supply chain. So, thank you so much, Andrew, for your for your time this afternoon and for that um, for that overview. It's um, I've been around in supply chain here for many years, and this I still can't um, get my head around. I think it's one of those mental blocks. But thank you all for being here, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers.